Well, Halloween is over. You know what that means. Marine Corps' birthday's coming up. November 10th, 1775. Don't forget about it. I will. You won't forget about it because I'm going to continue to remind you about it until, until that day comes. But welcome back, everybody. This is Wealth, Power, and Influence. I'm Jason Stapleton. So glad you're here. We're talking a little bit about, uh, we've got a little politics in the mix today, more for fun than anything else. And then we're going to talk a little bit about... Uh, <laughs> It's, it bothers me that this was said, but I'm going I'm to read a little bit from the article. Legrand, who runs the uh, International Monetary Fund, suggesting that you, you ought to just be happy with the fact that you have no savings or your savings is getting eaten up uh, and that you just have a job. Because apparently that's what settles, that, that's what the, the, the powers that be have decided settles for. Uh, acceptable life goals is is just maintaining and having a job and thank goodness for people like her and Mario Draghi who uh, who are diligently working to eviscerate the monetary system uh, and deplete your savings and make it unprofitable for you to invest or save uh, because it's for your own good right it's always for your own good Every time they take a right or a privilege away, every time that they, uh, that they modify the rules to benefit them instead of you, it's always for your best interest. That's, that's what they're looking. They're looking out for you, looking out for you. But uh, uh, before we get started today, I, I do want to put out uh, one comment, just a, just a, just a heartfelt, um, I, I don't even know what you say. I, Bruce has been a longtime member of our private Facebook group. He's been an active member of it and just a wonderful guy. And for years now, he has been um, taking care of, of his very, of his son who has some disabilities. And on Saturday, uh, his son passed. And I'm, I'm reading through, I mean, I, I, I was reading through the posts that he made in, in our private group. And I just, I, I don't know, I, I was having trouble I was choking up a little bit in reading it, and, and I'm, I'm doing better now, but I was really worried to even comment on it today that I, I wouldn't be able to, to get through it. But um, I, I, don't, I don't know what you've had to deal with over the last several years, 30 years, Bruce, um, but I, I just, I'm both deeply sorry for your loss and at the same time incredibly impressed with your ability to persevere, to survive, and, and to thrive um, in the midst of uh, what is, is, was no doubt a difficult days every day, and, but probably mixed with a lot of joy and, and happiness too. And so I just, I, I don't know what to say. I, I don't. I can't imagine losing a child. It, it's actually, it's one of my greatest fears. Um, and so I, I just wish you'd I, I wish you well, and just know that our thoughts, um, our prayers, our our, um, our hearts pour out to you, uh, and and thank you for being such an integral part of what we do, and uh, and and that thank you to the group for being a group that he felt comfortable enough coming and sharing that with, and he, he there he has friends there, uh, and he knew that that was a safe place for him to go and, and to share that. So I'm that's that to me also is, uh, was a real blessing to me to see that there's something that we created that has that has had that kind of impact. So I'm, I'm just grateful for everybody in that group as well. So let me read a little bit about uh, from this article, uh, zero hedge it says any hopes that the replacement of Mario Draghi will, uh, who on Halloween left the ECB more, more polarized than ever as the core European nations revolt against the Italian uh, profli- pro- profligately, pro- profligately. <laughs> Gosh. loose monetary policy and an unprecedented public demonstration of discord with the European Central Bank. Um, in an appeal to Germany's sense of solidarity and the hopes that the German memory of hyperinflation has faded enough, Legrand said that there isn't enough solidarity in the single currency area, adding, we share a currency, but we don't share much uh, budgetary policy for now. Those who have the room to maneuver, those that have a budget surplus, the, that's to say Germany, the Netherlands, 
Uh, why not use that budget surplus to invest in infrastructure? Why not invest in education? Why not invest in innovation to allow for better rebalancing, asks Legrand. Basically, what she's saying is, why don't all of these, none of these other countries have surpluses? They're, not, they're all withering on the vine because of bad economic policy. And because uh, Germany has such a large export economy, they're looking at them and saying, you have all this money. Why don't you make more bad decisions? To benefit all these other countries who who already made the bad decisions. Why don't you spend every penny that you have in reserve? Why don't you end up like all these other countries? Because it would be better if we were all equally poor rather than all equally or unequally successful. This is, I'm just, I'm baffled by this. It makes absolutely no sense. Um, he, she went on to say, let me see, I'm trying to find the section in here where she actually talks about when asked about the impact of negative rates on savers, Ms. Legrand said on, on Thursday that they should think about how much worse the situation would be if the ECB had not cut rates as much as it had. Actually, we'll never know whether it would have been worse. We know for a time there would have been a struggle, but there's nothing to suggest that long-term uh, money manipulation and long-term uh, economic manipulation is somehow a net benefit. In fact, history serves as a guide and shows us that in virtually every single instance, it has ended up in larger bubbles, greater recessions, more, more pain, more anguish, requiring only more intervention. It is... It is absolutely unacceptable to allow people like this to continue to push a narrative that says, if it weren't for us, things would be a lot worse. No, it's because of you that things are as bad as they are now. Okay? That's what everybody needs to understand. Quote, she goes on. Would we not be in a situation today with much higher unemployment and far lower growth rate? And isn't it true that ultimately we have done the right thing to act in favor of jobs and of growth rather than in uh, protection of, of savers? She asked, no, none of that's proven. In fact, all of the evidence points to the contrary. It, she acted in favor of this is let me read it again. Would we not be in a situation today with much higher unemployment and far lower growth rate? No. No. In fact, we're at zero, almost zero growth rate at this point because we're getting less and less of a return on the stimulus money that you keep pumping into the economy. You are wiping out savers. You're getting rid of the store of capital reserves in our, in our world that is required for growth. It is not consumption, for the last time, for the 50th time, it is not consumption that drives an economy. It is production. And in order to create production, you must have a store of resources. You have to have it. They went on to say, the unemployment rate in the 19th century Eurozone has fallen from 12% in 2013 to 8.2% last year. GDP growth in the single currency zone was 1.8% last year, and the ECB expects it to slow to 1.1%. 1. 1. They're getting 1% growth. You, you want to guess what inflation is? Yeah, it's a lot higher than 1%. They're, they're, they're lauding the fact that they've managed to bring unemployment down from 12% to 8.2%. You know what it would be if the central banks would get out of the business of manipulating the economy, the currency, and interest rates? It would be near zero. You want to know how we know this? We, there are actually periods of time in history when that's been tried. And we know what the unemployment rates are when you have when you have a strong currency and you have and you have a government that stays largely out of market manipulation so yeah if you want to go from and look at do something for me matt take a look at um unemployment rate in singapore and then after that i'm going to look while you're looking there unemployment in Hong Kong. Okay. 2.9%. Hong Kong has a 2.9% unemployment rate. Okay. Now, which, 
what do what do we know about Hong Kong that's radically different than the ECB and all and the collective company uh, countries inside the eurozone? We know that it is a much economically freer society than the eurozone is. It turns out that the more you point the cart towards individual liberty, economic freedom, and non-intervention, the lower unemployment is. 2.2. 2.2% in Singapore, which is arguably, I got freest, if you look up freest countries on earth, the Cato does a study every year, freedom index. Mm-mm-mm. World Population Review. I'm looking for the, the Freedom Index. Um, there it is, Cato. Human Freedom Index. Let's go and look at this. We'll pull this up. Maybe it's, oh, Heritage does it. It's the economic freedom. So Hong Kong's number one. Overall score of 90.2. Singapore's number two, 89.4. Okay. New Zealand. What's the unemployment rate in New Zealand? Mm -hmm. Let's look at um, 4.2. 4.2% in Australia. Half, or I'm sorry, New Zealand. Half of what it is in the Eurozone. Let's take a look at another one. If that evidence wasn't enough, I'm just going down the list here. Freest countries on the earth. Most, uh, let's try uh, Switzerland. 2.1. 2.1% in Switzerland. Let's try Ireland. Ireland's part of the Eurozone, so they're probably... Maybe we get lucky. 5.3. 5.3, still better. Take a look at Canada. Five point eight. Five point eight. Okay, here's what I'm getting at. The freer a country is... The less economic restriction it has, the less regulation, the less government it has, the better it is for everybody. The very notion that she gets to come out and proclaim to the world, you should be glad we did this because now unemployment is only a staggering 8%. This is the world they live in, by the way, people. Look at France. France's unemployment. I'll bet it's still in double digits. As of August, it says 8.5. 8.5, okay. So 8.5, basically right in there with the rest of the Eurozone. They are equally in misery over there. Youth unemployment is like 19.3. Youth unemployment, 20%? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it, is, it is foolish for anyone in the face of such mounting evidence to suggest anything other than intervention at any scale by central banks or the, the, the bank of banks uh, is somehow positive for our economy and positive for our world. It does nothing but tear us down. And yet, this gets almost no retort from mainstream press. I mean, it, it, the fact that, I mean, take a look at this. I'll, I'll give you another, another article that I just pulled from Fee. Questions that politicians claiming single payer would lower health care costs. So these are the questions that uh, Jim Kelly over at fee.org says, if you think that single payer government monopoly of our health care system is a good idea, ask a few questions. He says, question one, in what country is single payer making health care cheaper from year from one year to the next? You see, see, if they're talking about taking over the healthcare field and that that somehow is going to drive costs down and that we're going to stop seeing this uh, almost uh, this huge increase year over year of healthcare costs and somehow government intervention and government running the system will help with that just take a look at health healthcare cost growth rates okay in any of the so-called single payer systems it is year over year getting worse getting more expensive and actually rising at a faster rate than ours than here in America. So for example, we rise at about if you take a look at healthcare cross growth rates, we're growing at about 4.5% a year. If you take a look at Norway, it's 4.9, Switzerland it's 5, Denmark it's 5.1. Okay? Uh, the United Kingdom 5.9%. Uh, where else who else has single payer? 
Uh, Canada's at 4.1%. They're doing a little bit better than we are. So year over year, costs are not declining anywhere. And part of the reason Canada has a better number is because all of the most complex Canadian healthcare issues are all managed in the States. In the States, yeah. They, they all come here. Question two. Where has adopting single-payer lowered costs? The U.K. saw costs rise when it launched its National Health Service in 1948. Health Minister, uh, somebody, Adwen Bren, <laughs> bought, doctors off, uh, bought doctors off to win support for it. Pin up demand, put it over budget immediately, and in the first year, it spent 32 times what it had planned for eyeglasses. That's just one area, Right. Over the subsequent 68 years, costs have grown at an average of 4% per year between 1947 and 1951. Uh, prescription volume nearly tripled. Want to know why? Because when it's quote-unquote free, you go get as much as you want. This is what causes the massive wait times, the inability to get complex surgery or difficult procedures done, the, the, the government sending out, oh, we're sorry, but you're on a waiting list and you can come get your, you, you can come get your uh, MRI in exactly seven to nine months. I mean, it's, it's, this is what happens when there is no direct tie to cost. Question three, what other function has government taken over and made cheaper over time. Certainly not education, not defense, not po police or fire protection. Can you name one area where government has taken over and reduced costs, just reduced cost, much less increased quality of care? It doesn't happen anywhere ever. Explain to me why it is ever a good idea to put government in charge of anything. What have they done well? Question, uh, what is it? Question, oh, the, question four. How often have politicians voted to put millions of Americans out of jobs? This is a good one. Even if health care wastes were easy to spot and fix, single, single payers still won't do it. The single digit profits mentioned above are typical. Less than a dime for every health care dollar gets distributed to someone as profit. The great majority goes into someone's paycheck. Maybe a nurse, maybe an advertising copywriter, maybe an IT guy uh, at the FDA. Health care is 18% of the U.S. economy, which means 30 million of the country's 165 million jobs. Any health care reform that has us put fewer dollars in means fewer dollars out to all those people. What he's essentially saying is, if you want real cost savings, a lot of people are going to have to lose their job to get it. It's the only way to do it. And when was the last time that any politician supported widespread layoffs in any industry? Do you think that's going to be a big jobs winner? Try and close a base in any city in America. There's not a single politician who would ever support that. Too many jobs. Industry builds up around military bases. Entire industries would crumble and would be lost if the base shut down. You can't shut them. You can't get rid of them. Oh. So it's not going to happen. And essentially what I'm getting at is this. Because there is no, they, because they didn't have to do anything to earn the money. And because they are not providing for themselves. So what was what was it that uh, Milton Friedman said? He's like, there, there are four ways to spend money. You can spend your money on you. You can spend your money on someone else. You can spend somebody else's money on you. And you can spend somebody else's money on somebody else. He says, the government spends somebody else's money on someone else. And so they have absolutely no incentive to control costs or manage expenses. The goal is just simply to acquire as much possible money as, as, as they can and to create as many programs as they can out of that. There, there's no incentive to, to really ask good questions. Because if you're spending your money on you, you tend to be very discerning about that. You're also very discerning if you're going to spend your money on somebody else. Okay? You're going to care about cost, but you're not really going to care about quality. Right, much. but you don't care so much about quality, right? Then you, you ask a question, well, what if I'm spending somebody else's money on me? Well, then we tend to be very generous, don't we? We care, uh, we care very little about cost, but we really like the quality. Okay? When you talk about 
somebody else's money on someone else, they don't care about cost or quality. That's the type of health care that you're going to get, just like it's the kind of education you get, just the, the type of flagrant and, and unnecessary military spending that we do across the board. No incentive to control costs. No incentive to get the best quality product for the cheapest price. None. And there will never be. So if you can't name a single thing that government does better and that improves either in quality or cost when government takes over, why on earth would you give them any power or authority to do anything? How we, why, what part of our economy should they run? The answer is none. Now, this doesn't mean, and this is where Matt and I probably disagree a little bit, this doesn't mean that there don't need to be rules, that, that there, is, there, there is not some structure and order to an economy. The difference that I think, uh, that I see, is that when those rules are created, they should be created fu- foundationally and fundamentally from the don't hurt people and don't take their stuff mentality. Meaning, if you are not preventing someone else from pursuing their own self-interest, then there shouldn't be a law preventing you from doing it. You should have, uh, you should decide pretty much what you want to pay, who you want to pay, when you're going to pay them. All that stuff should be decided by the market. There shouldn't be massive amounts of regulation and uh, and red tape and taxes that go into creating more regulation and more red tape. It should be largely free and untethered. Uh, like I said, with some very clear cut laws that say, look, you can't steal from somebody else. You can't manipulate. You can't lie. You can't deceive someone else. And uh, in order to get them to purchase fraud, waste, abuse, those types of things are are clearly things that that we need that we need to pr- protection against. Or we need some form of redress against. Right. Um, I don't know how I, do you think of it differently than that? No, I agree completely okay. with everything you just said. I just would say. I think I think you don't agree with everything you just said. What do you um, mean? Because you said something like one of the phrases you use is that you think that the the rules should be decided by the market, and I do believe that the rules should be decided by the market. But that that precludes having a central authority that decides the rules and then enforces them. But you because the, the deciding the rules is one thing, but then enforcing them breaks the rules. If you have a central authority that's breaking the rules, that, that that's enforcing the rules then they're the one if they're deciding it and enforcing it then they've now broken that relationship let's so. let's kill this idea of a central authority but there has to be some sort of governing there has to be some sort of governing body that says yes you actually did commit this crime you did violate and now you owe and and if you're not going to pay then force is going to be used to compel you uh, against your will because you've been found to have committed a, a violation of of what we would consider, you know, the, 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 this idea that we hold true, which is that you shouldn't hurt people who shouldn't take their stuff. So how do you get around that? That's a way of managing it. It's just that that way of managing it always tends toward becoming a central authority. That's the natural nature of it. So, yeah. so there's, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a, 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 a jump that you're making in your logic here where you're saying that there needs to be some sort of enforcement mechanism. Correct. Therefore there needs to be a particular unique authority that's delegated in, to enforce. But enforcement can de- can and does develop naturally in the market. That's where it came from in the first place. So you don't you don't need to have some sort of central authority or some sort of 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 um particularly delegated authority to a- a- attain this method of redress that you're looking for. You just need to have a method of redress. So maybe that method of redress is if someone steals from you, you go kill them. That, that's a method of redress. Now, you have to decide then, well, do you prefer that method of redress or do you, defer, do you prefer to have a central authority that when someone steals from you, you go to that central authority and that central authority goes and grabs them and then does whatever. I, I'm not, I, when I talk about it, it, I think that there is, it, this is where I disagree a lot with um, folks who, who have a, a very anarcho-capitalist perspective is that I think that it, in the same way, oftentimes socialism you can create a, in a, a magical world. You can create a world where socialism works. And in small scales with people who are willing to comply and, and to do it, it probably can work for very long periods of time. Uh, the problem is human nature prevents it from ever being widely adopted by, uh, by any group of people. Uh, same thing I think is true for the type of 
the type of system a lot of anarcho-capitalists envision. And because, I would say the same thing is true for the type of system you're describing. Well, I, I don't, I don't disagree. Ideal, there's an ideal world where you can describe how it would work, but when it comes to actually the rubber meeting the road, it never actually ends up the way that it's planned on. It always, right. human nature and, and, and greed and ever, whatever, always pulls it off of that road into the ditch. So it comes back to, like you said, with, with socialism, it can work on specific levels. And this is because human beings... Groups of human beings are entities in, unto themselves. So a hundred human beings act differently than a thousand human beings. Right. It's a totally different entity. So the type of having a central authority that manages this type of thing can work on local levels because there's an immediate response to someone who's abusing their power. They can be, this is one of the reasons. Like that, a homeowner's association and something like that. Potentially, yeah. yeah. This is one of the reasons my, one thing I like to say is that I prefer monarchy to democracy because the only difference between monarchy and anarchy is a single bullet. So, and in, in that case, I'm saying anarchy is a good thing, but so if you, you, you need to have the people who are in power need to have an immediate, um, uh, interfacing response to the people who are around them and they need to have an incentive structure set up that they don't, they're not going to abuse that power. And when you give them carte blanche to both determine the law and enforce the law, that creates a set of incentives that will always lead to corruption and centralizing power. Without a doubt. Yeah. Without, I, I think, I think the same, uh, again, just. I'll finish off by just saying I think the same is true regardless of what system you employ, mm -hmm. and and it's why we don't spend a lot of time anymore talking about this stuff. Just simply because what I find is that the the mo longer we talk about it, the more we agree that human beings are, have a propensity to ab abuse, mm -hmm. and that often those who are the biggest and the strongest and the meanest are the ones who are most prone to that abuse, and, and that. Uh, uh, they also tend to be the most ambitious. And so it's always been my contention that you you need to put yourself in a position where you can you can be able to move and leave, right? So exactly. if you have a small community I, of people and and you decide that you don't like the leadership or the the group decides that you've committed a crime or, or a, a violation of, of their law, they can just ask you to leave and you got to go. Or you can leave and go to some other community. I would much rather see you in a position where you could do that on a larger scale, uh, given the world that we live in. Because frankly, the discussion about this, while philosophically interesting, has absolutely no value to us as individuals, other than understanding the difference between right and wrong. That regardless of how much power you may hold, you should always conduct yourself and make your decisions based around these these very basic principles of we don't hurt people, we don't take their stuff, we don't aggress against people. And if you can just stick with that, uh, and that is the foundation for all of your decision making, you're going to do really well, and and you're going to bring a, you're going to you're going to amass a lot of people around you who. Um, who love and admire and appreciate you because they know that you're always going to be straight with them. You're always going to do what's right. Doesn't mean you won't go to war and that you won't fight to win in, in, in the arena of in the marketplace, but competition co cooperation are all part of, of a free society. And so as long as you're not doing things to prevent other people from succeeding, like uh, breaking the law, like uh, I watched, I got to go and see, a movie uh, this weekend it's called uh, the irishman it was at netflix and and they were doing a private showing which by the way ozzy and sharon osborne were sitting like <laughs> right down the row from me like they walked in and um uh you know uh nancy elbows me and she goes look over there and i look over i'm like what and i didn't notice and she goes that's ozzy and sharon osborne and i go no it's not and then all of a sudden sharon turns her head to the side and i saw i'm like that's Sharon Osbourne and sitting right next to her. And he looked good too. I couldn't believe how good he looked. He looked really healthy. And, uh, I was just like, so then I'm like, now I'm, I'm like fanboying a little bit. I'm like, that's awesome. Like he's right there. <laughs> Should have jumped up and been yeah. like, all aboard. Oh man. <laughs> and then what was funny was that I, like, as soon as, as soon as it went dark, right before the credits even came up, I saw two shadows like oh, to the door and as soon as the lights came up, as the credits started to roll, they were gone. So they were not hanging out to be with, hang out with anybody. They were, they shot out of there as quick as they could. But I'm watching The Irishman, 
And one of the things that the unions used to do is they that they used to go after these companies that didn't want to unionize and they would slash the tires on their trucks, they'd firebomb their buildings, they would they would aggress in order to in order to give themselves control and to maintain control. Uh, if there was a union shop and a non-union shop, the union would go out and they would attack these guys. And I'm sure that some of that still occurs today. Uh, I happen to know of some guys who didn't want to join a union, and they, it was very common if they didn't want to join that they'd come out and their tires would be slashed. Little things like that. See, that's, that's not acceptable in, in any society. Competing with them in the open market and winning based on being better is, is acceptable going out and destroying their business, uh, lying to, to create false rumors about them and who they are and what they do, those are just immoral things that is, are going to happen in a society. But those are the types of things that I think r- that there, need to be, there needs to be a law or order in place in order to facilitate somebody being able to go and say, look, I, I've done nothing wrong. These guys are abusing me and, and I need some help because I, I can't survive. Otherwise, it's just the biggest companies, whoever's got the meanest, meanest group of people wins out over the people who are trying to play by the rules and do what's right. You see this now on a different scale where instead of you going out and slashing tires and burning down other people's businesses, Amazon will just come in and say, we want to buy your business. And if you don't sell to Amazon, Amazon will just simply re, uh, readdress their algorithm to cut your sales. So your stuff just doesn't appear or they'll undercut you for a period of time by offering their products at a cheaper price than yours so that it again cuts into your profit margins. They they did this to a diaper company. Um, This woman had created this great diaper company and I can't remember the name of it, but they came to him and said, hey, we want you to sell. Sell it to us. We want to uh, because it, they sold basically through Amazon. She said, no, nah, I don't really want to. I think it was worth like 10 million dollars or something they offered her. And she said, yeah, I don't really want to sell. I want to build it. And overnight, they like cut her profits by like 30%. Sales were down by 30%. It was just, it was, it was, it was devastating to their company. That's the power Amazon has. It's the way that they operate. And then they go out and they go to government and they petition government for new law, new regulation, like in the car companies, when the car companies want better fuel efficiency standards and they advocate for that. Why are they doing that? It prevents competition. Those are the types of ways that the modern day uh, companies are blocking competition. But all of it, as Matt said, ties back to a government who capitulates and who assists in that type of malfeasance and in, in, in that type of criminal activity. And that's what it is. It's criminal activity. The only way to get around it is just to continue to be better and, and to put yourself into a position always that you're not reliant on an Amazon or anybody else. And to try and make as much money as you can so that you can have as much financial security as possible. A lot of those types of things, it isn't so much that you need to have some sort of enforcement mechanism that goes after those companies after they've done that. That's one approach, but it just doesn't work well because any any institution that's powerful enough to be used as an enforcement mechanism like that will just be a honeypot for so amazon instead of going after you they'll just buy the government essentially and this is the this has been the case from ancient times to all the way up till now um so really this is where i'm very compelled by the idea of these are these are engineering problems you don't need to to force amazon to redress this this issue that they created you just need to put yourself in a position where they can't do it in the first place and that's an engineering problem you, you have to come up with a method of insulating your market share and insulating protecting yourself from them to where it becomes so costly for them to do that that it's not worth it um, and this is where tech, technological advancement is headed this is where um, it, there's there's far more progress to be made this way um, I was related to the the issue we were talking about with um, with the economy and with this idea of of negative interest rates and trying to basically it's this Keynesian idea that you have to um, you have to boost consumption in order to stimulate production. It's they have the cart before the horse, and Keynes was the kind of the progenitor of this idea. It was developing before him, but he was the one who really put legs on it, and he knew exactly what he was doing. In the foreword to his the German 
uh, edition of his general theory book, he wrote, The theory of aggregate production, which is the point of the following book, nevertheless can be much easier adapted to the conditions of a totalitarian state than the theory of production and distribution of a given production put forth under conditions of free competition and a large degree of laissez-faire. He knew explicitly that the model he was proposing, which has become the standard model of economic theory, he knew explicitly that it was most most readily adapted to a totalitarian yeah. state. Well, here's what I here's what I love about Keynes, though, and he gets a really bad rap, is that Keynes only cared about what would work. And when Keynes was writing, it was in the very early stages of underst- of our understanding of economics and, and how it works. And he proposed some really incredible theories at the time and was working to implement them. But Keynes loved to change his mind. He would say he would talk with the, all the certainty in the world that something would work and that this is the way that you needed to do it. And then the second he was proven wrong, he would just change. And he said, OK, well, no, this is the way we need to do it. He was accused of. Uh, of flip-flopping so often, uh, one of his famous quotes was, well, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? Right? And so he was, he wanted, I think if Keynes had continued to live to see the product of what he was suggesting, he would have molded and modified his opinions many, many times over the years. He just didn't get the chance to do it. And so when, what I loved about him was that he didn't care whether it was a totalitarian state. He wouldn't care whether it was a, a, a complete anarch, a state of anarchy. Didn't matter to him what the society looked like as long as it, that was the best functioning society. And, and to, to put legs on that, it, he didn't care because he was a product of the aristocracy. And this is the mindset of the aristocracy is they don't care what the structure is as long as it creates, quote unquote, the best society. Correct. And the best society is whatever one has us at the top that's essentially there i'm not saying this is a sinister perspective it's it's they're like they say oh the national interest of the united states well it's in the national interest of the united states that multinational corporations are successful because if multinational corporations are successful then i'm wealthier and everyone around me is wealthier so right. great right so they just don't see the people who are being being downtrodden by it right and this is how you can get the appearance of a of an orchestrated conspiracy when really it's just a bunch of people who are all acting in, the, in their own interests yeah and well in Keynes and all Keynes being being part of that group what was also one who adamantly believed that there were a group of people who should be running things and then there are other people who should not be running at things now here's the Thing. I happen to also believe that. I think that there are people who should be in charge and should be running stuff, and there should be people who are not in charge. Anybody who's ever worked at a company and had a manager who should have never been in that position knows that dude, that chick should not be where she is, yet there she is, right? That everybody sees that. Uh, and so that that is a that's an absolutely true concept or statement the, the the thing i struggle with is okay well how does one decide well it, there needs to be a, a very free market approach that those who can do the best should be allowed to rise those who can't should be left to i mean as i always say the world needs ditch diggers too if you have no ambition <laughs> no drive no you're of modest intelligence and and, and you really don't you don't take any steps to improve yourself, well, don't be surprised when you find yourself at the bottom begging for the scraps off somebody else's table because that's what you've earned. That That's that's the best you can do. The reason that you make minimum wage after living in this country for 30 years is because you're not worth very much. I'm not talking about you as a human being and your life. I'm talking about your productive capacity. So if you're not worth much, don't expect somebody to pay you as though you uh, put forth the same amount of effort, the same amount of ability, the same amount of, of work that somebody who's far ahead of you has done. Because hands down, y- y- it doesn't work that way. The reason I started distancing myself from the idea of being an anarchist, quote unquote, is because I don't know if I've said this on the show before. I know I've told you that I don't want my identity to be wrapped up in the state if i identify myself as an anarchist it's like someone identifying themselves as as an atheist their whole identity is them vis-a-vis god as an anarchist my whole identity is me via via the state so now this is why like libertarians are supposedly anti-state but they're the most wrapped up in politics of anybody so i can't control society like voting of all people libertarians understand that voting has no effect like like the one uh uh communist i can't remember what her name was anarcho-communist she said if voting if voting worked they wouldn't allow it if it did anything they wouldn't allow it right 
you can't control society. I can't, I can talk until I'm blue in the face about the ideal structure of society, but I'm not, I, I can't build that. I can build my piece of it. I can control my own life. I can control where I go. I can control the people around me and I can control the value that I provide to other people. And if I do that, if I point my nose in that direction and I just head off starting to create the most value that I can and insulate myself as best as I can from the negative effects of other people around me, and then I encourage other people to do the exact same, that's the way that I can bring about a quote unquote ideal society. You're not gonna bring it about by trying to beat it into other people's heads. And that's what we've been talking about like for the last year basically is that that's, that's how you create the ideal society. But you know, I gotta tell you about our sponsors today guys. First, Indochino, love these guys. Founded on the belief that you don't need to spend a fortune on a custom wardrobe. I wore, had to go to uh, uh, Palm Springs for a, a wedding this last weekend or weekend before and I took my brand new Indochino suit. I gotta tell you, I got multiple compliments from that suit. They had no idea. Like uh, somebody even asked me who, like, who it was from. I said Indochino, and they're like, "Oh, I keep hearing about that company, but I've never gone in." And I said, you, "You're not going to find a better suit. Like, it, it, you're, you will." I've said, "I'm never buying another suit, another thousand dollar suit in my life. This is where I'm going, and you ought to be there too." And frankly, I, I mean, I was one of the sharpest dressed guys there. I'm not going to lie. It's not just. I mean, this helps, you know, right in here, but. Uh, you know, it, it was really the suit that made the difference. So, uh, in a, the world's largest made-to-measure men's brand, you can shop it. By, like they got forty locations. Uh, the best part is they're affordable. Almost all of their custom clothing is under four hundred dollars. I wish I just I I cannot impress upon you how nice these suits are for what you're spending. Uh, the Black Friday event is on now until December first. Get custom suits for just two hundred and eighty-nine. Get out of here! What? Get custom suits for just $289, plus the best price of the year on overcoats, shirts, and more. I'm going to go buy another suit. Start your style upgrade now with $30 off your total purchase of $399 or more at Indochino.com when you enter Stapleton at checkout. Plus, you get free shipping. That's Indochino.com promo code Stapleton for $30 off your total purchase of $399 or more. Uh, an incredible deal on a made to me on made to measure clothing. A the you really have no excuses, right? It, it's you, if you don't if you're I, I saw a guy in the Starbucks the other day, and I could tell he was he was an up and comer. You, you could tell just by how he was dressed. He wasn't making a lot of money, but he was trying to look like he was making a lot of money. And you can typically tell this in a couple of ways. So for those of you who are trying to figure out how do I, if I'm breaking into a new industry or I'm getting started, how do I look like I'm s successful when maybe I'm not as successful as I'd like? Uh, first thing is your shirt. Uh, Indochino suits are beautiful. Go get yourself a nice custom tailored suit. Uh, but the shirt that you wear underneath is of critical importance. Huge difference between a $60 shirt and a $200 shirt. Spend the extra money to get the $200 shirt. Okay. Second thing is shoes. Uh, people forget that you're looking at people's feet a lot. And a really nice pair of shoes, again, if you bought a pair of shoes, uh, uh, dress shoes at Payless, looks a lot different than if you went to Nordstrom's or to somewhere at a really nice place and got yourself a four or $500 pair of shoes. Um, you don't even actually have to go that expensive. They've got three, $400 pairs of shoes that are really nice. Get yourself a couple pairs of those. And then last but not least is you've got to have the suit tailored. It has to be tailored and custom tailored is better than just buying off the rack and having somebody tailor it. But the reason I knew that this guy was not doing as well as he wanted to promote was that the suit was nice. He bought a nice suit. He even had on a decent tie, but the shirt was cheap. The shoes were cheap and he had about a, I don't know, like uh, they, he had a huge break in his pant leg, which just, it made his pants look way too long. Like he was kind of swimming in them. And frankly, most men, cause they don't wear suits all the time and they don't, they don't dress that well on a day to day basis. Uh, don't pay attention to that stuff. Just keep in mind uh, people who have a lot to invest with you pay attention to those things and how you are perceived. The imagery that you promote is hugely important when it comes to whether or not someone's going to listen to you and someone's going to buy from you. So in anyway, Indo Indochino.com promo code Stapleton. Now we got policy genius. Tis the season 
to elect benefits through your workplace. Uh, you may be new to open enrollment, but it's a great time to check on your life insurance as well. Policy Genius is the easy way to shop for life insurance plans uh, that are not tied to your job. In minutes, you can compare quotes from top insurers to find the best prices. Only once you apply, the Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and the red tape. That's nice. The life insurance you buy through Policy Genius stays with you even if you leave your job. So, whether you're looking looking at your workplace benefits this month um, or you're reassessing your life insurance, make sure you double check with PolicyGenius.com. Uh, Policy Genius, the easy way to compare and buy life insurance. It's your responsibility, guys. Nobody should have to pay to put you in the ground. When you die, at least have enough that they can put you into the ground and that you're, you know, that somebody's not coming out of pocket to take care of you after death. Last one's plexiderm. Guys, here's the deal. You know that I like to preach stepping out of your comfort zone and that it's mandatory to achieving success while stepping out of your personal comfort zone is important to look your best. Those under eye bags, fine lines and wrinkles can really hinder that. Well, I found a product that helps. It's called Plexiderm Rapid Reduction Serum and is clinically studied serum that visibly eliminates your wrinkles, crow's feet and under eye bags in minutes. Forget surgery. That's exactly what you need to feel comfortable in your own skin. Yeah, if you've been looking at your mug and going, oh, man, maybe I need to have some work done. Give this a try first. See if it doesn't change how you look and feel. I tried it. I love it. So will you. Take action on your life. Go to triplexiderm.com and use my code STAPLETON for 50% off and an additional $10 off. That's right. You get 50% off your purchase plus an extra $10 off. This offer is also available if you want to call 1-800-685-1292. That's 1-800-685-1292 and mention code STAPLETON. Plexiderm.com today. Use code STAPLETON at checkout. Triplexiderm.com. Okay. Woo! Appreciate you guys being such good patrons of our sponsors too, by the way. I got, uh, we got a lot of really great sponsors and they keep coming back over and over again because you guys go and buy the products if you can use them. So I appreciate you all doing that. Thank you very much. Now, let's talk about something else. This recent study that they did in Japan, Microsoft did this study. You all have heard about how giving people three-day weekends increases productivity and, inc and decreases costs. And so there's this big push for for companies to go to four-day weeks. And some of you guys work on split shifts where you work 10 hours a day for four days or whatever, and it, that's that's how you you are 12 hours a day. I can't remember what the how it breaks down. But basically, you're working a total of five days in four days. Well, they went to Japan, and they decided to test because Japan consistently has really low satisfaction rates among employees. And they... They have a philosophy over there that's very much work, 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 work. And they, they've they tried a lot of different things to try and improve productivity, in, improve uh, employee satisfaction and happiness. Because, frankly, someone who is really happy with their job and happy with the place that they work tend to want to do a better job than somebody who hates their job. So it makes sense that they would want this. Now Microsoft has tried, last August, they tried a working reform project called the Work-Life Choice Challenge Summer 2019. For one month last August, the company implemented a three-day weekend every week, giving 3,200 employees every Friday off during the month. This special paid vacation did not come at the expense of any other vacation time. The results, they say, were incredible. First off, the reductions. Employees took 25.4% fewer days off during the month, uh, printed 58 percent less pages on the printer and use 23 percent less 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 electricity because obviously the uh, office was closed uh, one day every single week on Friday next the increases productivity went up by a staggering 39.9 percent that means even though employees were working far less time more work was actually getting done uh, and even though it should seem obvious, it's also important to note that 92.1% of employees say that they liked the four-day work week. Of course they did. Um, now, before you go instituting a four-day work week at your office, I, I want you to consider a couple of things and the way human nature works. Because I think I, I'm, I am very critical of long, whatever the long-term productivity effects are going to be of policy like this. So, so, for example, 
if you put somebody under pressure, they will tend to perform better and be more efficient because of an adjusted timeline. So as we get closer and closer, I've told you I'm a procrastinator. So I tend to like futz around with stuff until the very last minute. And then I get laser focused and I get a massive amount of work done over a period of time. I have learned to create for myself a way to harness this by working in, in blocks and in focus blocks where I say, okay, this is a four hour focus block. And for this four hours, here's the stuff I got to get done in this four hours. And so I work like diligently over that narrow period of time. And then I get a release and I get to go do something else and, and hang out, watch TV, whatever. Doing that has increased my productivity significantly over the years. If you take somebody who's normally working five days a week and all of a sudden he's got all this time, five days to get stuff done. And you say, hey, for the next month, you're only going to have four days. Now, we still want you to get stuff done but you only have four days to get it done in. Naturally, what happens is in, internally, subconsciously, is folks start looking for efficiencies. They start working to try and get everything they need done into that four days when they normally had five. And so what does this result in? It results in people being far more productive, at least in the beginning, during these shorter days or these, uh, these shorter weeks, okay? The problem with this is, while you may initially reorganize your life in order to accomplish a certain amount, five days worth of work in four, what tends to happen is you get a law of diminishing return. As psychologically, people become conditioned to working four days rather than five. And productivity tends to decline over time because people become adjusted to a four-day work week rather than a five. What would be far better for them is to say, um, this month is a normal month. Next month is a half month, is a four day month. Uh, the month after that is normal. The month after that is normal. The month after that is a four day month. That would over time probably maintain efficiency better than just a blanket. Oh, we're only going to work four days a week now because it keeps people you probably get more productivity out of the five days too, honestly, because if you're doing it four days and then you go back to five, now all of a sudden people are in the mindset of, I got to get all this stuff done in four days, but then I got the extra day. So they increase the amount of workload that they're doing because now they're, the efficiencies have created new space where other work can be done. I do think it's uh, the idea of, it, oh, they took fewer days off. That's, that's huge for the company because that means that they're paying them for you know, less time that they're not working. Because what happens is, is if you got a Friday off, you can go and schedule your doctor's appointment. You can go look at houses or whatever on that Friday, rather than having to take a day off work to go and do it. Because there's a lot of stuff that you can't do during the middle of the week. You can only do it on the weekends. And so I thought this was a really interesting study that you might try implementing in your own company and see what kind of productive gains you can get. Just remember a blanket policy you, you need to do this over a significant period of time to see what sort of productivity increases you're going to get. And you're far better off to modify and to go from four to five days a week back and forth rather than just all once going 100% of the time four days a week. Um, what else we got in here? A couple minutes left in the show. I thought this was funny. Smugglers are now sawing through Trump's wall. They have... There's these solid metal bars that they put up on the Trump wall. And I don't know how many miles of this do they actually have they actually laid out. Do you know? I, last I heard there wasn't very much. Yeah, it's just it's it's a it's a very small number of miles that they've got. Uh, uh The breaches have been made using a popular cordless household tool known as a reciprocating saw that retails at hardware stores for about a hundred dollars. When fitted with specialized blades, the saws can slice through one of the bars, steel bars, uh, and concrete uh, uh, bollards. Is that a bollard? Is that right? In minutes. They got a picture of the wall here with a big, two big holes in it uh, where they can slide people through. I, I mean, I'm really glad we didn't just dump 
uh, $23 billion or $40 billion or whatever it would have ended up costing to build this wall, only to find out that with a handheld saw from Home Depot, you could cut through the, <laughs> cut through the pipes in about, you know, in about three minutes. It says that it's, uh, the Trump administration has so far completed 76 miles of new barriers, all of it in areas like San Diego where the structures replaced older, shorter, and in some cases dilapidated fencing. Another 158 miles is under construction, and the agency said 276 miles are in a pre-construction phase. Oh, great. You know what the best way to manage this would be? Sell off the border and let the people who own the land be responsible for who comes across it. Yeah. They'll do a far better job of it. I guarantee it. Yeah. Just, re- yeah, just let them own it. It's crazy. Just freaking crazy. I can't even imagine the burden that it would be to be responsible for the entire border between the U.S. and Mexico, all of the all of the that mileage to be responsible for that whole thing, and you have to go and police the whole thing. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Just divvy it up among whoever wants to own that land and whoever wants to to manage it for whatever reason. Yeah, and then if somebody comes across and they shouldn't have come across and they hurt someone, then the person who let them through is responsible for paying damages. You I could absolutely do that. And what to, what what's going to happen instantly if you do that is some cartel is going to bribe this guy uh, with a lot of money to let him dig a tunnel and uh, you know that's that's but they're doing that already yeah exactly so, i was gonna say know, so they're gonna do it out in the open anyway. as opposed to yeah. doing it with the government yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> this is the i mean at least at least some locals getting rich it's <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> get the money back to the people that's right at least some money's going into the hands of some farmer um rather than you know <laughs> God, it's just it's it's baffling to me and then last but not least i'll uh i'll just bring this to your attention I like to do this just so that you guys kind of understand the jobs that you and I had growing up as kids, um, depending on the age of your children, their children will not have those jobs. Those jobs are no longer going to exist anymore. Uh, One great example, Walmart is currently spending a massive amount of money on new AI technology. And this year alone, the company has gorged on three tech deals and uh, they dropped three hundred million to acquire an AI startup, Dynamic Yield, to be its biggest acquisition in two decades. McDonald's goal is to fit each location with many data centers, uh, learning-powered drive-throughs, and touchscreen tech that make personal uh, personalized recommendations. So they're going to replace all the workers at these fast food joints with automated technology and uh, artificial intelligence because and then probably have one or two people hire in people on staff to manage if something happens to go wrong because AI is going to be really good for repetitive tasks like this and 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 how do I handle certain situations like what if the fryer is too hot I got to turn it down and that type of stuff AI is going to be really good at and you're going to start to see these jobs It'll start with kiosks instead of having people who take your order and it will move on to people, the machines that run the fryers and the ones that flip the burgers and put the stuff together. All those jobs are going to go away. And if you want to speed this process up, just keep jacking up the minimum wage because it becomes more cost effective, more beneficial to do it, the higher the minimum wage gets. But regardless, this technology is coming. And so... The question I always have, and you don't ever know because the jobs will come from somewhere, but where is the kid who's going to be born 10 years from now, where's he going to learn the skills? What skills is he going to be learning that you and I never learned? Will they all know how to code? Will they all know how to, you know, will they all be internet entrepreneurs? Will we move back towards a society that's that's largely uh, entrepreneurial Or will there be some new company or system that rises out of out of this new technology that that creates new jobs for a whole new group of employees that they can pay more money to? I I don't I don't know. I can't look into the future and see. I just know that if you're not constantly improving and building on your uh, your human capital, you're going to be left behind. And if you're under the age of 60 It's this is a serious because you're going to be living through it and especially your children and your grandchildren. You need to be you need to be teaching them well. You need to be helping them understand that what the school is teaching them is important is not really important. 
that what they're prepping them for is to go to college to become good worker bees. And that is not going to be something in the future that's going to be required. It will be specific knowledge and skill in specific industries uh, that, that, are, that are more creative and that require more complex thinking that artificial intelligence won't be able to manage. This is a lot of people look at this like the Andrew Yangs of the world look at this as a bad thing. And to me, it's a fantastic thing because it means that society is progressing forward and standards of living are being raised for everyone else. So when you and Jason says not to 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 uh, not to be left high and dry, really what that the subtext of that is, don't put yourself in a position where you're being a burden to society as society is moving on. Make sure that you're flexible and um, and have forethought and uh, and the ability to adapt and learn new skills because it's easier than ever now to learn new skills. Literally anything you want to learn how to do, you can find it on YouTube or you can go search. Just just Google it. Literally, it's just Google it and you can learn how to do absolutely anything because well, Epstein didn't kill himself. Yeah. <laughs> so good the <laughs> memes are so good i was sitting at home by myself yesterday just laughing at the memes the epstein memes i'm just scrolling through facebook and uh, and reading some comments and stuff and like every third one is a jeffrey epstein meme and it's great it's awesome <laughs> yeah and uh did you see the guy on fox no With the dog i'll show it to you later no, no. But uh, there was a, so piggybacking off that and just closing out the show today. Uh, this morning, we were looking at building websites, and as most of the website building now is drag and drop, but we wanted this button to do something different that this the this platform that we use wouldn't let it do. And so I went into the 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 code, the CSS code, and I brought Amy over and I showed her. Okay, here's the section that has the button, and here's how you know where that is, and here's the text versus the button itself and the, the code there. And I said, we need to make this link open in a new window. And I said, to do that, and I just Googled HTML, make it open in a new window, and then it popped up, and it shows you exactly what the code is. You can, this is how I learned how to code my first website, was literally just like that, going to Google, asking Google the answer, and somebody out there has created entire databases for free of information you can just go pull. Here's how you do it. Here's an example. Here's a different example, a different way. Here's another way you can do it with a different example. It has never been easier. I don't know is an excuse. I don't know how is an excuse. It should There's, be an opportunity. It should be an opportunity. And if you are not right now today focused on what am I doing so that I'm more valuable tomorrow than I am today? You, you, you're in trouble. You just are. And you're in the wrong place because we're going to talk about this a lot on this show. Um, with that said, guys, I hope you had a great time. I will be back here uh, on Tuesday, Wednesday, right? Wednesday. Yes. Yep. We'll be back on Wednesday. on Wednesday. Then I'm going to be in Vegas on Friday. So I'll have a recorded show for you on Friday. And uh, looking forward to it. Oh, last thing before you go. Tomorrow's the day. Tomorrow I am releasing the first video in our three-part video series on, on branding and on communication. So if you want, I'm going to be teaching you how to rise above the noise and how to become, uh, how to stand out in an age where that is very difficult to do online. I'm going to teach you how to, once, once people see you and they recognize you exist, how to get them to like you. And then the last video, I'm going to teach you how to sell. I'm going to teach you some, some things about psychology and the way that we process information and what people are looking for that are going to help you sell what you've got in a way that makes people really grateful that you sold it to them and who are dying to get it. So I'm going to do all of that over the course of about three or four videos. And all you got to do is just watch your inbox because I'm going to be sending the email out tomorrow at about 8 o'clock in the morning Eastern um, Pacific time. So if you're not on the list, jasonstapleton.com forward slash winners will put you on that list so that you don't miss out. Uh, everybody else, see you on Wednesday.